Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dad Vice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dad Vice TV Live episode number. I think it's 279. Wow, that is a lot of video content help, help out there helping you thrive with CKD, helping you live longer, helping you live better, all sorts of great stuff so that you can take control of your kidney disease, not feel um, the burden and all the worry that comes with it because now you know more about it and you can be proactive in your care. Now, tonight, my guest is one of my most requested guests. He's a nephrologist and he is the author of, I'm going to keep saying it, my favorite book, called Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. And this book right here, when I was diagnosed, I wish my doctor would have said, James, don't worry. Here, read this book. It is such an easy read and so, so helpful. And you can get it at any bookstore. You can order it. They've got it at um, Barnes & Nobles. I also have a link here, Go dadvicetv.com slash book that'll take you straight to it on Amazon. But it's great to go visit your local mom and pop bookstore. They'd love the business and they can order a copy in for you. Look at that. Debbie says, I purchased the book. Very helpful. It is awesome. It is a great book. All right. So my guest here to talk about your bones and kidney disease. Dr. Steven Rosansky. Hey, Doc, how you doing? I'm good, James. I'm very good. Good to see you and uh, good to uh, be on your show. As always, I look forward to being on your show. And um, hopefully this is going to be a topic tonight that I don't think very many people have talked about. I know I haven't. And uh, so this is going to be a, a new one for most of your viewers. Uh, and uh, you've got some important information, and I've got some really good news for people with kidney disease, uh, because the way we used to treat the, what they call CKD bone disease was miserable. It was just horrible. And I'm gonna talk to you all about it and tell you what the latest treatments are, and um, it's gonna be a lot easier for you folks. Um, you want me to introduce myself, I guess, James. So yeah, the I most important going. part of this is introducing yourself so they know that you're not pushing the woo-woo, all those fake cures and things. And I'll tell you, just before we got on here, I got an email of someone trying to sell me one of those fake cures. Like, <laughs> oh, but tell them about your your qualifications. Okay, so <clears throat> I have been a doctor since 1972. I've tr treated kidney patients for over 40 years. I uh, started a kidney program here in Columbia, South Carolina. I also have done a lot of uh, research work and my research has been recognized as being very important uh, relating to when to start dialysis at what level of kidney function and factors that influence progression of decline of kidney function. Those are some of the areas of my research and I have about a hundred different publications. Uh, so, and I've also done research with some of the drugs that we're going to talk about tonight. And I'll give you some of my inside stories about it. And uh, I wrote that book that James uh, put up there because um, I, my, my research that basically showed that starting dialysis too early at higher levels of kidney function at around 10 plus percent or 15 plus percent of kidney function is actually harmful. And, uh, and this is a message I wanted to get out to you folks, you patients with kidney disease. And that's one of the main reasons why I wrote the book. And then I found out that there's so many of you that are getting scared about your kidney disease because of all the, as James and I say, the woo woo on the internet that scares the heck out of you. And you really don't need to be scared because the vast majority of you have so-called stage three CKD, EGFR is around 45 to 60, and you know, you're not really at high risk of going on dialysis or getting a kidney transplant. And a lot of our prior talks discussed this issue in great detail.
But James, you're going to be glad to know that our two favorite things, diet and exercise, are going to be the winners again tonight. It's going to be <laughs> like unbelievable how that always winds up being some of the most important things that you folks out there can do. But let's let's get started because this is a, this is a confusing area. I have to admit, it's confusing, and the experts have changed their opinions about how to manage it. But let's talk about what am I talking about? We're talking about. Do you have any idea, James? Why the, how the kidneys relate to your bones? Any idea? Well, does it have anything to do with the vitamin D? Uh, exactly. What they do with vitamin That's D? One. Perfect. Perfect. That's and I'm one. guessing calcium because of phosphorus. Yes, and phosphorus. That's you got two out of three out of four. Or what's the last one? The last one's a hormone, and it relates to a gland. Epo. In <laughs> no, no, no. By no, right, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> That was our last discussion about anemia. No, no, no. It's the gland in your neck, on your thyroids, on your thyroids, these tiny little pea-sized glands. They are called the parathyroid glands. Does that even ring a bell? Parathyroid. Yes, because I know there's a test for it, and I'll tell you, Doc, I've been living with kidney disease almost five years. I know very little about the parathyroid. You're going to learn about it tonight, James. There so, we go. So the deal is, because of abnormalities of these four things that James just mentioned, your calcium, blood calcium, your blood phosphorus, your blood, your blood levels of vitamin D, and your blood levels of PTH, patients with especially advanced uh, kidney disease like stage four and five, they are subject to getting uh, bone fractures, bone pain, and the other thing that's very concerning is calcification of your blood vessels, which can lead to heart attacks and strokes. So this is pretty serious stuff. So we're going to break it down uh, with the four different components. And um, let's start out with the last one that James mentioned, the parathyroids. Okay. I love that you're giving me credit, though I didn't mention it. <laughs> So the parathyroids are these tiny little glands in your neck, on your thyroid gland. And what they react to is they react to a high phosphorus and they react to a low calcium. So how does that relate to your kidney disease? Okay. And let's try to, this is a little hard to understand, so I'm going to go very slowly. So you may or may, you folks with advanced kidney disease probably know about phosphorus and, and your doctor has probably told you to try to get your phosphorus under control. I don't know about you, James. Have you, have you had that problem or not? Not yet. Not no, yet. I, I've been lucky. My phosphorus your has phosphorus been is not a great. Okay. So why does the phosphorus level go up? Okay. So what happens is that uh, because we have the vitamin D problem uh, and we're going to get to vitamin D later, uh, what, what PTH does is it tries to get rid of the phosphorus. Okay. And it, it acts on the kidney to, to treat the phosphorus. The problem is as your kidney function goes down, you can only beat up the kidney so much to get rid of that phosphorus because it depends on how much phosphorus is getting into the kidney. That makes sense. How much is yep. being filtered as your filtration drops? There's less phosphorus to be put out in the pee. PTH decreases the reabsorption of the phosphorus, which means more gets out in the pee. That's one of the key issues, all right? The other thing is, as your kidney disease progresses, you get less of the active vitamin D. Do you know anything about active vitamin D, James? Have you heard of that? Yes. Active vitamin D is the vitamin D your body uses. And when you take like D3, you need to convert it to active vitamin D. Yeah. So it's one, it's the one, it's, without getting too tech, it's called the one hydroxylation. The liver does 25 hydroxylation. The kidney does the one hydroxylation through enzymes. And it's that 125 vitamin D that's a real powerful vitamin D. And um, so what does PTH have to do with bone? Any idea? 
No, but I know phosphorus is directly connected to your bones because it's in there, and calcium. it and calcium are almost like magnets. They they yeah, kind of go together. In the bone. That's right. You're absolutely right. Calcium and phosphorus are important components of the bone. The parathyroid hormones, levels of parathyroid hormone, acts to either increase the amount of bone that's laid down, or or have more bone that's reabsorbed by these cells that eat bone. It's called osteoclast. That means they eat the bone and they take the components of bone and put it in the bloodstream. And, uh, and what happens is as the PTH rises, right, that uh, bone phosphorus will come out and that uh, is going to stimulate more PTH. And it's a vicious cycle because vitamin D is doing the same thing as parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is going to try to get the kidney to reabsorb more calcium and pee out the phosphorus. Same thing goes for vitamin D. Gets the kidney to reabsorb calcium and pee out the phosphorus. So if if the um, if the phosphorus is going up and you're stimulating all that parathyroid hormone, but the vitamin D is not sufficient. It's going to continue to increase the parathyroid hormone and mess with your bones. And that's essentially what this whole bone disease is about. And the way you can figure out, the way your doctor, if they know, if they know what they're doing, and I have to tell you folks that a lot of the general practitioners are not going to know about what I'm talking about tonight. It's pretty sophisticated. And I would hope you, all of your kidney doctors are up to date. They may not be. So they may not, they may tell you to do differently than I'm going to tell you tonight, especially you folks that have EGFRs less than 30, uh, and especially those with EGFRs less than 15 CKD5s, all right? So you get the stimulation of the parathyroid hormone, which is really the big problem and lack of vitamin D. But the biggest thing that we focus on is this parathyroid. So we get this vicious cycle. You're trying to get the kidney to get rid of the phosphorus. The phosphorus, as your GFR goes down, is going to get higher and higher. And you just get big parathyroid glands and very high parathyroid levels and more and more bone, uh, weak bones, weak bones. The other thing that was not really concentrated on enough was the fact that like we just talked about, you get high phosphorus, you get high calcium, it can calcify your blood vessels and calcified blood vessels can clot can clot off like the arteries in the heart the coronary arteries they get calcified you can get heart attacks you can get more clots in there so that's the big worry you get increased theoretical risk of heart attacks and strokes mm -hmm. okay and that and we knew, we've known that for a long time too too high calcium too high phosphorus they will calcify the blood vessels so you get secondary hyperparathyroidism. Do you know what the three labs are going to be? What? So secondary is that anybody with at least CKD 3B, let's say less than, you know, less than 45 EGFR and certainly less than 30. Uh, the parathyroid hormone is almost invariably going to be high, going to be increased. Okay. And the phosphorus is also going to be elevated. Right. And the calcium is going to be normal or a little bit low. Rarely, you can even get a tumor in the parathyroids. It's called a parathyroid adenoma. And that's called not secondary, but tertiary. These are like big words. But in that case, it's, it's even higher levels of PTH. And not only is the phosphorus high, but the calcium is also high. So back in you know 10 years 20 years ago we didn't do things the way i'm going to tell you tonight uh the latest international guidelines make some really good suggestions I'm, when i say international guidelines i'm talking about the international group of kidney doctors of which i have been part of them which we make recommendations about how kidney patients around the world should deal with their kidney disease it's called kdigo k-d-i-g-o I highly recommend those of you who want to know about your kidney disease, look up KDIGO on the internet. That's the real McCoy. That's 
the experts all around the world figuring out what you should do about your kidney stuff. That's who you should listen to. Not all these guys and girls pushing the woo-woo, wearing white coats, claiming they're doctors, claiming they know what the heck they're talking about, or people that write books who are not doctors and claim that you should be on very low protein diets, which oh. essentially will kill you from malnutrition. And, and, and buy their supplements and buy their with their protein, it. buy their supplements because you're on, it's absolutely dangerous and not to be done. Not to be done. Okay. I We're wonder who you're that. talking about. Hmm. <laughs> We're going to get back to that later. All right. So what the latest guidelines are saying is those of you, especially uh, older females, um, may have already gotten something called a DEXA scan. Have you heard of that, uh, James? DEXA scan? No. Okay. A DEXA scan is a, a type of x-ray which will tell you how dense your bones are. It's the, the kind of test that especially older men and women, more so women, need to get done at least at some point to see how thin your bones are. Why do we worry about how thin your bones are, James? What is one of the commonest ways that people in my age and older, I'm 76, die from? Yeah, it's a what fracture happens? and an infection, right? Exactly. Fractures. Fractures. They wind up getting fractures of their hip, mm -hmm. the commonest one. And then, let James say, they're in bed because of the fracture. They may get pneumonia. And a lot of people die after fractures in their older age. And the CKD is going to increase the risk, especially as it gets to lower and lower GFRs, okay, because of what we're going to talk about. So the suggestion is get a DEXA scan. Let's see how thin the bones are, you know. And just like we would do treating osteoporosis in the, all patients without kidney failure, it's a different kind of bone problem, the osteoporosis, but it's the same thing. You want to know how bad off you are with your bones. Because then we can decide how aggressive to get. Not everybody needs to be on these horrible drugs called phosphate binders, which I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. Um, now, before we go to that, yeah, for this yeah. DEXA scan, is this something that, you know, when you get a certain age, you should have done every so often? Or when, how, when should you start? Having something okay, like that that's, done. That's a good question. I, the, the American Public Health Association has guidelines for recommendations like colonoscopy every 10 years <sighs> up until, let's say, age 75, somewhere after 50 to 75. And I think, and I'm not, you have to check me on this. I think they are recommending for especially females uh, mm -hmm. over uh, 60 or 65 to at least get a baseline. And whether all men should do it is another story because men do not have as much of a problem with dense, uh, with thin bones. And that has to do, as we're gonna talk about, with exercise. We're gonna get back to exercise in a few minutes, okay. So uh, the other thing, which is not a bad idea, and, and, I, and this is just a suggestion, is, uh, to get a plain x-ray uh, of the of the belly and and see and maybe get an echocardiogram. You heard of the echocardiograms to yep. check out your heart and your heart valves to see if there's calcifications. And if you've already got calcifications in some of your some of your blood vessels, you better get aggressive about treating the high parathyroid levels. Okay? Not everybody needs to be aggressive about the treatment. So <clears throat> the current recommendation is like so much we've been talking about, get the trend of the mm -hmm. parathyroid hormone level. Just like I've told patients on this show to get the trend of your urine protein, that's you gotta get lots of values over time, you know, every three to six months to see whether your protein in the urine is stable going up or down. And as we've talked about, a lot of protein in the urine is a strong predictor that your kidney function is going to be going down. You want to get that protein level in the urine down. And we talked about this 
uh, on some of the prior Dad Advice TV talks. Um, you want to get the trend of PT, and probably when you get to be 3B, let's say less than 45, some doctors are doing it with 3A, 45 to 60 EGFR, but certainly once you get down to less than 45, at least get a baseline parathyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. And if you're certainly uh, CKD4 or 5, parathyroid hormone could be checked once or twice a year. All right? And you want to know the trend. So here's I'm looking thing. mine up right okay. now okay, to see cool. where mine is. Cool, yeah. So uh, you want the trend because you want to know, is that parathyroid? Because it's like any other test. It's going to vary. You may get a level one day that's going to be, you know, the next time you do it, it may be, you know, up or down by 10 or 20%. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's going up a lot and the trend is clearly going up, you got to treat it. If it's not going up and it's fairly stable, then you could probably wait. So here's another really important thing that they came up with. It's probably appropriate for your parathyroid hormone to be elevated when you have CKD. It's no longer the case that we want to get it to normal like we might have done 10, 20 years ago. Because that could be even worse for you if you get it down too low then allowing it to be up two to three times normal. Two to three times normal is fine. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, so in the, the range that's reasonable for people with, like you, James, I think you're stage four, would be like 150 to 300. What's your PTH? All right. Mine's looking really good. <laughs> My PTH intact, it says, yeah, 25.8. You're good, okay. And my You're calcium 10.1. Those, yeah, good. This is from okay. just a few but, months but, ago. But, but you, you're not on, are you on active vitamin D or are you on phosphate varnish? Because your PTH level does not indicate a need for it. I, my vitamin D was really high because they were having me take it and it was like 140. My D level, and they got me off it for a long, for a while. It's still coming down. Well, okay, they, I, I you know, again, you, a lot of doctors are not going to be up to speed on what we're talking about tonight. You probably should not be taking that vitamin D. Yeah, I stopped it about three months ago, but no. the doctor told me it takes a long time to come back down. Right, but it's not just your vitamin D. It's not the vitamin D per se. It's that calcium. Your calcium is in the upper end of the range, James. And high calcium is not a good thing for you because it can calcify your arteries and have some mm. predictive value for getting heart attacks and strokes and all that other bad stuff. So that's what they're emphasizing more is not letting that calcium get out of control. And, you know, we used to be pushing. I push vitamin D on my patients all the time, 10, 20 years ago. We were just routinely given it, no longer recommended. So um, when your vitamin D level is somewhere between 150 to 300, which again, may be okay, as long as it's not continuing to rise, you're gonna get, as it goes up further, you're gonna get bone fractures, you're gonna get bone cysts, you may get bone pain, you may get collapse of vertebra. But mm. No aggressive treatment until it really gets up too high. Um, and as I said, James, one of the things that we realize is if we suppress that PTH level, if we get that PTH too low, you're going to have even a worse problem. Okay. Mm. If you get it too low, you'll have a worse problem. It's called adynamic bone disease. And that winds up having the worst high calcium and phosphorus levels of all types. And again, we worry about the combination of too high a phosphorus and too high a calcium. Mm -hmm. Those two together to calcify the blood vessels. So you want to get the trend and you don't want to get too aggressive about trying to lower that PTH or trying to get the, the vitamin D levels too high. No longer recommended in, in kidney. I mean, if you're not a kidney patient, Having a normal vitamin D probably has benefits, you know, mm -hmm. for, the, for the average patient. It's not a, not a kidney patient. 
So let me give you the history and you folks that have kidney disease today and are listening to this talk, you are very lucky because I used to, we used to beat our patients up about their phosphorus levels going up too high and about them not taking these horse pills called phosphate binders. Oh, yeah. And I cannot imagine, and, and we would, you know, the dietitian would get on them and we'd talk to them about, you know, you, your phosphorus is too elevated. You, they're supposed to take it with meals. Yeah, I mean, you take it like 30 minutes or 20 minutes before your yeah, meal. Yeah, and it's like, oh, disgusting. I mean, please, that is horrible. That's torture. Don't need to do it anymore, folks. You heard it right here. You heard it first right here. Not for everybody, but most of you don't have to worry about taking these horse pills. And <laughs> I used to give um, routinely these phosphate binders because that's what we thought was the right thing to do and a lot of them. But we started worrying about that high calcium level because a lot of the phosphate binders that we used contain calcium. The two common ones that I use all the time through my career are something called calcium carbonate, which is what the uh, what the reefs are made of, the bay, you know, the calcium carbonate, right? The skeleton of calcium carbonate from uh, and and calcium acetate, which I thought was a great idea because not only does it bind the phosphorus, but that acetate can help with the acidosis. You know, you get too much acid as your kidney function goes down. So I said, oh, that was great, but no longer recommended. Now, what about uh, antacids, the calcium that's in those? It's not a question. Okay, so calcium carbonate is an acid, isn't it? Yeah. That's Tums. That's Tums, okay. <clears throat> so so here, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. I'm talking to, to an auto guy, so I got to use the right metaphor <laughs> and if everyone knew what we talked about right before the show it's all car stuff yeah james knows his stuff boy he knows all about cars he really does okay so why did they change their tune why did the international group of kidney experts decide to not push those binders those miserable phosphate binders to take with meals, those horse pills, because reviewing 60 studies with almost 8,000 patients, they found that there was no improvement in the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke or getting calcifications in your blood vessels or getting a fracture with these aggressive binder therapies versus placebo therapy. Oh. And that's no, a big sample group, no 8,000. No difference, okay? And they're so unpleasant. So back in my early stages of my career, I'll give you some history now. This is funny. Not really funny. Is it? We used aluminum containing an acid called Amphigel, which I guess you could still buy, I guess. But what we found out, and again, just to bind the phosphorus, we found out that the, the aluminum was causing some people to get dementia. I <laughs> don't like that. I mean, it's, and, and that's why I, I, I'm reluctant to jump on board of all new drugs. You know, like we got these Ozempic, the weight loss drugs, which may well turn out to be, you know, the greatest things to slice bread, but give it a while to make sure there's no downsides. Okay. I yeah. highly recommend people not aggressively going into new drug therapy because you're not going to know what the downsides are probably for a while. So aluminum, especially <clears throat> when we combined it with stuff to treat acidosis, you know, because because of the acid thing, caused aluminum toxicity. So we don't use that anymore. Amphigel, it's an antacid. The other ones, as we said, Tums, calcium carbonate, calcium acetate. So the, <clears throat> and I did some of this research, <clears throat> And I could tell you, I did research on the non-calcium containing phosphate binders. Mm -hmm. The two that, that I did, I, well, one of them is Sivalimir, is one name, big name. <clears throat> and the other one is Lanthanum. And some of you folks out there may be on these drugs. 
And I can tell you, when I was trying to do these studies on the lanthanum, you know, to get FDA approval, the non-calcium containing phosphate bar, these patients complain horribly about the big pills, made them nauseous. I mean, you folks are so lucky today that you don't have to be, you know, bothered by this terrible uh, method of, of getting your PTH under control and your bone disease under control. Well, and did it work back then? Back then, taking you those can big lower pills? you can lower phosphorus, but it's just so unpleasant and unnecessary. Yeah, <laughs> unnecessary, not recommended. Now, I mean, some people need it, especially when you go on dialysis, uh, and especially if you've got you know high pH levels and you want to get them down. Um, you may need to get on these binders, especially if you're having trouble getting that PTH under control. But we're going to talk about how do we get the PTH under control. There's the controversial stuff we're talking about, phosphate binders, mm-hmm. the calcium or non-calcium. And then there's the non-controversial stuff, which is what, James, we said at the beginning of this talk. Diet and exercise. Yes, yes. Two Absolutely. things we have control over. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the new thinking is why not try to prevent these problems with the parathyroid hormone and the phosphorus uh, rather than take these horse pills. Mm-hmm. So try to limit the phosphate intake, but there's ways to do it. How do we limit your dietary phosphate? Do not go on these very low protein diets to to limit dietary phosphorus. Makes no sense. It is very, very dangerous. Please don't do it. You may have malnutrition and that will give you the same problems that we're talking about tonight, including fractures and, you know, muscle wasting, et cetera. Don't want to do that. There's, Two types of phosphorus, James. You know what the two types are? You may have discussed this with Jen, right? It's going to be natural and the <laughs> artificial. The artificial is absorbed 80 to 100%. The natural could be 40 to 60%. Brilliant, James. I like it. That is great. You're on it. You are on I'm, it. Jen, I'm writing Jen a book about well. the kidney diet. Oh, you're writing a book too. Okay. <laughs> but Jen, Jen, in your book, you learned it. Okay, so <clears throat> there's, as James said, there's organic phosphorus, which is a big word to say it's coming from food. <laughs> yeah. And then there's real phosphorus. food, not fake real food. food, real food. And then there's phosphorus, uh, that is chemicals. Uh, and we're going to talk about the chemicals, which are really bad for you. Mm-hmm. So as, as James just said, the, the real food phosphorus, if it comes from animal proteins, meats, more of that phosphorus is going to get into your bloodstream than if it comes from plant-based uh, phosphorus, which less will get in your blood. Another ring the bell for plant-based diets. Yep. Okay. Even for people with CKD4 and maybe even CKD5, as long as you monitor your potassium. Okay. So uh, what about the real horrible stuff? that we're talking about that's in food. Phosphorus additives. The sneaky snake is what I call it because there's so many versions of them and it's hard to always spot them easily. I look for that PHOS in the ingredients and you absorb some of them up to 100%. Good, James. You're on it. You are on it tonight. And why do they put this stuff in, okay? These are the processed foods. It's a process means we're trying to keep these foods looking good in their color, their moisture, their texture, and their shelf life. Hey, we don't care if we're killing people. We want our foods to be on the shelf longer and not have to be thrown out. We want to make as much money as possible. Yep. So it's all about the money. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, natural food, speaking of money is a little bit more expensive. The real foods. Mm -hmm. And, 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 but if you look, you can find whole foods, real foods, you know, uh, plant-based stuff 
that's not going to break your bank. And all of the things that you guys and girls are probably doing regularly are going to have a lot of phosphorus. The sugary beverages, the sugary coffee, the sugary tea, the energy drinks, most of your soft drinks, even the flavored water, folks. You don't need flavored water. Tap water is just fine. It's not going to give you phosphorus. All of your deli meats, your hot dogs, your sausages, your packaged foods, your, or your snack foods, you know. I mean, I'm not telling you to never eat any of the stuff, but limit it. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're proactive in limiting these kinds of foods, the cereal bars, right? Um, most of your- Gloria is asking, does a Twinkie with a three-year shelf life have any phosphorus in it, you think? <laughs> I think she answered the question. Yeah, she did. Excellent question. That was a tongue-in-cheek question. And the tongue is sticking way out of the cheek there. Nice one. I like it. <laughs> um, again, if you stay with homemade foods and fresh foods, you're going to help lick this problem, de- decrease the potential parathyroid hormone problems and your bone problems. And now let's get into the best news and the one I keep hammering about because it is the cure all for better brain function, longevity for sure is exercise. And in this case, it's a special kind of exercise. What kind of exercise, James, is going to help your bones? You know the answer to that one? Hmm. I'm going to guess anaerobic. Or aerobic? You are not going to help your bones. You're going to help your cardiovascular system, <sighs> your heart, and your lungs. The thing that helps your bones is weights. Oh. Weight-bearing exercises. And one of the reasons, one of the theories, I guess, and it may have to also have to do with you know, female hormones, that females have more uh, thin bones than men is partly due to weight carrying more weight and and, and typically men would may have jobs where they're carrying more weights around and if you folks i I, as james just said you get into 20 30 minutes of just walking i'll be a happy camper and you will be doing great things for your after hardening of the arteries which again anyone with ckd you're at a higher risk of hardening of the arteries, which is the main thing you need to address if you don't have a lot of protein in the urine. If you just got the routine CKD3 without a lot of protein in the urine, your main job is decrease your risk of having an atherosclerotic event, strokes, heart attacks, decreased blood flow to your legs, etc. So if you can get to the gym and you can get on those exercise machines and those machines are going to exercise all the muscle groups of your body and here's another thing james just like we've talked about this your gfr your egfr your estimated kidney function or egfr declines by about one percent per year after about age 40 right expect it yep right? and we talked about that many times and look at our talks about age and CKD. <clears throat> so do your muscles and your bones. You're losing muscle mass at about the same rate. Isn't that interesting? And you're losing bone mass at about the same rate. And the way to prevent the loss of muscle mass and bone mass is guess what? Exercise, exercise especially weight bearing exercise. If you are able to get to a gym and a gym membership is a lot cheaper than a lot of the drugs that people are going to push on you, especially to treat this parathyroid business that we're talking about. If you can get on these, uh, if you can get into a gym and go a couple times a week to do uh, weight training, muscle training, you're going to help your bone problem. Now, the other uh, treatment for the high PTH, besides your diet and exercise, is going to be the phosphate binders that we talked about. Mm-hmm. 
and generally you should probably go to the lanthanum and the cevalimere uh, and, uh, and the vitamin D, but we're going to talk about vitamin D last. All right. So um, there's a drug that I did research on in phase two. So phase two is like early research. For, I, I work with Amgen on a drug called Sensipar or Sinicalcid, which I'm sure you never heard of, James. Nope, never have. So this drug is not for the majority of you folks. It's for the rare patient that's got a high PTH level and you can't get it down with other means. The vitamin D, the active vitamin D, uh, which we'll discuss in a minute, uh, or the phosphate binders. If you can't get it down, it's real high, this drug works. And what the drug does is kind of interesting. It kind of fools the parathyroid glands into thinking that your calcium level is higher. So the sensor on the gland mm. is going to sense as if the calcium level is high, turn off the PTH. That's the theoretical mechanism. And it, the drug works. I mean, you got real high PTH. And what we've done over, over my experience, and it's rarely done now, back you know, 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, we were doing it much more frequently, is taking out these parathyroid glands. That's tough. These tiny little glands, in rare instances, if you can't get that PTH down, and you can't get it down with the sinicalcid or the sensipar, you may be stuck with getting a parathyroid surgery, take those parathyroid glands out. Now, if it gets taken out, are you on like a medication for the rest of your life? So what uh, you do... This is, this is weird stuff. Okay. So these, there's, it's very complicated. They can actually measure the amount of hormone. We've got really fancy techniques to measure the amount of parathyroid hormones coming out of these tiny little pea-sized <laughs> parathyroid glands. Mm -hmm. So generally what they've done is they take, they do a three quarters, three out of four. They take, they take one of those little pea-sized, put it in your forearm. <laughs> They put a little piece of parathyroid gland in your forearm so that they can get to it. If the parathyroid home is still elevated, they may need to take a little piece out of it. <laughs> That's rare, <laughs> rare, rare, rarely done, rarely done. But that drug, I can tell you from my own experience that that uh, Sensipar or Sinicalcid has saved people from having to get that surgery. Very expensive drug, just like those Cevalimere uh, and Lanthanum, those other non-calcium Binders, very expensive. So that's the deal. All right. Now we're going to move on to vitamins. Boy, I'm going slower than I And thought. I'll tell you, there are a lot of questions. Okay. All right. Well, I'm <laughs> For surprised. tonight. Okay. All right. So um, should you take vitamins if you've got kidney disease? Should you all be taking vitamins, James, yes or no? And what vitamins should you take? So I take a renal multivitamin. Because my dietitian told me to. Why? Why? You don't know why? I'm guessing because having kidney disease, you do not manage vitamins the normal way. Exactly. You have trouble absorbing some of them. Well, you have trouble getting rid of them. Ah. So a normal vitamin that has a tablet, a normal multivitamin, has vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin K oh. in it. And right. those vitamins can accumulate if you've got especially advanced kidney disease. And they could theoretically kill you. I mean, it's not common. It's extremely rare, but you don't want to mess with it. So if you've got CKD4 or 5, uh, and, and if you have a good diet, you won't need any vitamins. But if your diet's not great and you want to take a vitamin, do what James is doing. Take a renal vitamin, and there's something called Renovite. It's a renal vitamin. You can buy it on Amazon. If you really want to take a vitamin and you're not eating well, take your Renovite. Maybe James has it in his office right there. But this is the one I take, Pro Renal Plus D, which also uh, like all the dialysis centers, all the dietitians I've ever visited, this is the one that they recommend. It's missing those things that we have okay, trouble but, getting rid of. But James, the latest is going to throw that out because it's pushing vitamin D. 
That's old news. We don't want to be pushing vitamin D. So that Renovite was pushing the vitamin D. Uh Uh You don't want to be pushing that vitamin D anymore. Okay? I mean, that's my thinking from the latest guidelines. So where do you get vitamin D normally? You get it from the foods. You can get it from tuna fish, salmon, you know, all the fortified dairy products, even the non-dairy milks. And even orange juice is fortified vitamin D. What is the natural source of vitamin D? Do you know where it comes from? The sun. Yes, good boy. Excellent, yeah. So there's some kind of chemical in your skin that when the sun reacts, it produces vitamin D. How cool is that, right? Also makes my freckles darker. (laughs) (laughs) But, But if you're in places... Where there's not a lot of sunlight, and especially in the wintertime, vitamin D levels tend to be a problem. Mm-hmm. Now, how does, we talked about this a little bit, how does kidney disease relate to vitamin D? I'm going to speed it up a little bit because I want to get some time for questions. I'm going a little slow. Okay. So we said that the kidney produces the, the most active form of vitamin D, which is 125 vitamin D. And vitamin D is doing the same thing that parathyroid hormone does. It gets more calcium. Well, vitamin D in the gut is gonna get more calcium and phosphorus absorbed, okay? And that's why people with generally osteoporosis, thin bones, they'll push vitamin D. Not for your kidney patients, okay? Because they have high phosphorus levels. And if you push that vitamin D and you get the calcium and the phosphorus up, you can calcify your blood vessels. That's why we're not pushing the vitamin D so much. Um, So the vitamin D also works on the kidney, just like parathyroid hormone does, uh, to to get rid of the phosphorus. But um, the thing is, as your uh, your calcium uh, goes up, uh, it will will lower the vitamin D. So, So one of the treatments for high PTH is to get the calcium up and to, and to, with vitamin D. But you also got to worry about the calcification. Um, now, who should uh, get um, vitamin D supplement? Uh, basically, the most recent guidelines is saying that the studies, the randomized controlled trials, have not demonstrated a benefit in vitamin D. They have not demonstrated, but they have demonstrated that these folks that were taking the vitamin D that got higher levels of calcium had more fatalities from high calcium. Wait, that's not good. Exactly. So that's why they're backing off on giving everybody the active form of vitamin D and these vitamins that have a lot of vitamin D on it may not be the greatest thing. I think for most of you folks with early CKD, it's probably fine. But as you get to stage four and five, that's where you start to get into uh, problems. And in general, if you've got those parathyroid hormone levels that are going up, you want to get the parathyroid hormone levels down, you've tried the diet, the exercise, and it's not going down, then you're going to have to use the vitamin D. You may have to use the phosphate binders, and you may even get to that sinicalcy, okay? Mm-hmm. But don't rush into doing any of those. And by the way, James, I'm looking at my notes. My next talk, July 10th, and we're going to talk about how to cure CKD and cure in air quotes. So I think you folks will be... Uh, happy to hear that one. And, we'll and we're not to selling questions. anything. Right. <laughs> There's no cure I'm selling, but I will tell you about how to cure it. All right. There are lots of questions. Hmm. Um, so someone asked Julianne, does the TSH test show PTH? No, TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. And as we talked about, this may confuse you folks out there, the parathyroids are located on the thyroid gland. So that's why they call it parathyroids. It means they're on the thyroid gland. 
but TSH is the diagnostic test to look for thyroid problems, not parathyroid. Parathyroid is the main hormone that CKD patients need to worry about. And then Gloria asks, we were talking about the DEXTA scan, is that the same as a bone density exam? Exactly. That's what you're measuring. You're seeing how thin your bones are. Exactly. And then Marie, Marion, sorry, got her name wrong the first time, was asking about sodium bicarbonate. Um, what do you recommend people use as an antacid? I think is a good way to summarize her question and others that are similar. Okay. Now, to just tie it into what we talked about tonight, I don't think any of you are taking Amphigel, the aluminum binders anymore. But if you happen to be on one, don't take what I'm going to tell you to treat your acids. A great thing to treat your acids is bicitrate, which is sodium citrate and citric acid, or sodium bicarbonate. Either one of them will work for those folks whose bicarb on your blood test is around 22 or less. And there is ongoing research, and one of my colleagues has been heavily involved with this, to see whether correcting the acid problem can slow decline of kidney function. The jury's out, but it's probably not gonna hurt you. So I would definitely take either sodium bicarbonate or something called bicitra. <clears throat> And, and for those out there, sodium bicarbonate is also known as baking soda. <clears throat> right, exactly. And it's very cheap in pills and much easier to take in pills than spooning uh, powdery baking soda. Right. Human asked, is hardening of the arteries the same as calcification of the arteries? Okay, so <clears throat> um, hardening of the arteries is referring to, I'm gonna see if James is gonna get this. What is the main blood test that we look at for your, your atherosclerotic changes? Darn it, I think I know it's the good and the bad cholesterol. Yes, okay. <laughs> Hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis basically refers to the deposition of cholesterol plaque in the arteries as part of that process when it gets severe and it could be even more dangerous is when those blood vessels get calcified because as we talked about if you got lots of calcium and phosphorus in your blood they may get into your blood vessels to increase the risk that those blood vessels are going to clot off okay all right very good and i'm glad you didn't make me say that word Arthrosclerotic, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Hardening of the arteries. All right. Human also asks, what if you have a high PTH, but your calcium, phosphorus, D, and potassium are all within the range? Any, Anything you have about that? Okay. So basically, again, if your calcium and phosphorus are normal and your PTH is within two to three times the normal value, nothing to do about it. On the other hand, if that PTH is, is gone from two to times normal to four times normal to six times normal, you're going to have to do something and you're probably going to want to, if your phosphorus isn't high, you don't need the phosphate binders, probably going to want to take active vitamin D, the 125 vitamin D. And if it's still not controlled, you may need to take that drug we talked about. Sinicalcin. All right. Jay Hudkey asks, what, where do you recommend vitamin D be for CKD patients? You mean the, le okay. So this yeah, the is level. really, yeah, I, I am extrapolating. In other words, the latest guidelines, which just came out very recently from the International Kidney Doctor Organization, they don't say what to do about vitamin D levels, let's say with CKD3A, which to me are people that are borderline to even have any kidney disease, right? Depending mm -hmm. on your age. Uh, it probably makes sense for most people without kidney disease to have your vitamin D level checked and try to get it normal because there's theoretical benefits of vitamin D in terms of immune protection, 
I know I personally took vitamin D when we were in the COVID uh, because there's a theoretical benefit for, for handling infections, handling inflammation. So if you're not one of these people with high phosphorus, uh, worried about, um, you know, calcif- calcifying your blood vessels, probably vitamin D is fine. Get, it, get, get vitamin D monitored and maybe get on vitamin D. But if you start getting into 3B, less than 45, certainly less than 30 EGFR, I'd be careful with the vitamin D. Very good. And someone asked, uh, what was that date again? It was July 10th. It's a Monday. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just figured that one out. Yeah, today. All right. Now, Alicia says she already has... <laughs> author she already has hardening of the arteries um is is it hopeless for her no no not at all listen we all have it you know james has it i have it anybody who's alive in this country uh as you get beyond 40 50 years of age and even sometimes 20 or 30 i mean we have seen in some of our military casualties sad situation that their blood vessels are already have hardening of the arteries. It's part of our Western culture. It has to do with our diet. It has to do with lack of exercise. It's a lifelong process of getting these plaques in the arteries, getting these blood vessels that can cause trouble for us. And, you know, it's a lifelong uh, attempt to, to decrease the problem. And one of the best things that you can do, which I highly recommend for all folks with CKD, is get your bad cholesterol down below 100 and i would even go below 60 if you can especially if you're diabetic get that ldl down as low as you can get it and tell your doctor if they're giving you a low dose of the of the cholesterol medicine that that you heard from the doctor the kidney doctor that you should try to give me more medicine doc because i want to get my bad cholesterol down as low as i can get it yeah, mine put me on, you know, after moving, I got a different doctor because my cholesterol was high. And you were always telling me, James, get that down, get that down. My new doctor, she put me on a pill and boy, was it effective and no side effects or yeah, anything. Yeah. And if you're having side effects, there's lots of different cholesterol drugs. Your doctor can easily switch you to another drug. All right, Velma asks, <laughs> And I've heard things about this before on the internet. Should you take vitamin K2 or K4 with vitamin D? Absolutely not. Again, vitamin K, like vitamin A or vitamin E, are not recommended as your kidney function goes down. They could poison you. So no, do not take it. Uh, someone asked me, was that a, a statins or what lowered my cholesterol, right? Doc? Exactly. That's okay, a statin. Good. Those are the statins. The cholesterol drugs, the proper name is a statin. Simvastatin, Lovastatin, Travastatin, anything with a statin name is the lipid drug that can lower your bad cholesterol or your LDL. I take so many pills now. You know, that, the gout pills. I don't know. I've lost track of which ones are for what exactly. <laughs> um, someone had asked, uh, human asked, can calcification or hardening be reversed? Good question. Good question. I do not think so. I don't have the definite answer, but I'll tell you this. What they've tried to look at is the cholesterol plaque. It's very hard to determine whether or not the lipid drugs, which are being used by, you know, large percentages of, of the population, these statins, whether they can decrease the plaque, let's say in your neck, the carotids. And there's some evidence that maybe they can. And I'll tell you something back 30 years ago, more than that, uh, I was having chest pain at a coronary angiogram. And I had some plaque in, in my uh, one of my major coronary arteries and the doctor at that time said get your LDL down and uh, you know it, it may it may reverse that that issue but there's no way to know for sure and it's it and all I could say is if you're at a higher risk and you are if you have CKD of getting a heart attack or a stroke 
Do all the right things. Get your LDL mm-hmm. down as low as you can. Get on a plant-based diet. Try to get on an exercise routine. Do what you can to control your faith. And those are some of the things that you can do. Very good, Doc. Well, it is past the top of the hour. Time flew. And I'll tell you, I did research before the video. There's very little information about about kidney disease and your bones. And this was a great talk. So informative. I learned so much. And I know so many people did. We had such great comments throughout the conversation. So thank you so much for being here. And I want to mention your book again. For those of you, you got to hear firsthand from Dr. Rowe. He has a book with so much helpful information out there for kidney patients called Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. This will help you better understand the disease. He talks about his smart diet, so many other things, and especially not starting dialysis too early. There's no benefit for the majority of people to starting it early. He describes the situations where starting at an earlier number is a viable solution, but why not to start it early? You know, who can wait to a lower GFR? Um, I encourage you all to, to get a copy of his book. And I will be back tomorrow night with Jen. We're going to be doing a live Q&A about renal diet. And Dr. Rosansky will be back here in about a month on Monday, July 10th, 7 p.m. Eastern. Same time, we'll be right here live. And thanks again, Doc. And thanks, everybody out there for joining us. Give the video a thumbs up. That helps YouTube recommend it so other people can find it and get this great information. And I'll see everyone else in the next video. Bye everyone.